Thank you uh, to the organizers. It's a real privilege uh, to address this audience. I hope my comments, which will betray a different perspective, um, will at least uh, serve to um, stimulate debate through the day. I see my role um, really as introducing a level of granularity, talking about individual researchers that are in this environment uh, that I would characterize as one of heightened emphasis on commercializing health research and focusing specifically on graduate students, postdocs, uh, scientists in their uh, early stages of their careers, emerging health researchers, I'll call them. So I'm going to move through two quick uh, key concerns that I think are associated with uh, emphasizing commercialization at the university level, um, then trying to bring that to a head by uh, sharing some recent data that I'm in the midst of analyzing um, from emerging and established health researchers in this country. It's based on a survey uh, that I've been conducting uh, with the group. So I'll be talking about commercialization's potential to shape research questions, its potential to limit knowledge flows, and then really thinking more or trying to put on the table for conversation concerns about how that might impact future generations of scientists rather than particular individual careers. My assumption behind these remarks, which I'm happy to defend in, in question and answers, um, is really that there's a fairly tight relationship between emphasizing commercialization and reliance on intellectual property to achieve commercialization. I'm happy to defend that assumption as you um, if you'd like to challenge that. So first concern that I think um, is connected to this environment that academics are increasingly uh, finding themselves in is around shaping research questions. And really the point I'm trying to make is that um, if we focus on commercializing, um, there's going to be a strong systematic preference for uh, kinds of interventions that are easier to exclude others from using, interventions that are easier to appropriate um, and reap the rewards of in the marketplace. So an example of that, uh, or an example of a kind of intervention that would not be uh, um, incentivized by focusing on commercialization is a surgical checklist, right? It's a kind of information good. Uh, it was developed, many of you probably know, um, to prevent infection uh, by a physician at Johns Hopkins in the United States. There were skepticism about whether this intervention would work across hospital settings with different resources, so there was a fair bit of costs involved in validating the technology, around a million dollars. Um, but the randomized control trial and subsequent studies have suggested that the be benefits of that intervention are quite huge. But the point that I'm trying to make is that this kind of intervention, it's really quite impossible to exclude others from using, right? You'd have to go into uh, surgical rooms in hospitals um, and try and, and, and police that kind of activity. Uh, so therefore, it's very difficult to sort of attach this to a product, something that you can appropriate. Um, and for that reason, if we focus on commercialization and there's that strong link to reliance on intellectual property, this kind of intervention is likely to be undervalued. Um, compared to interventions like drugs, which are easier to appropriate. But certain kinds of knowledge around drugs um, falls prey to the same kind of problem, specifically negative information. So does this drug work as well as an existing therapy? That kind of information, too, is hard to exclude others from using. Right? So a classic example of this would be new antihypertensive drugs during the 1980s. At the time, genetic, uh, generic diuretics were available. Um, but with the uh, introduction of the new antihypertensives, ACE inhibitors, uh, calcium channel blockers, um, with a much higher price tag, uh, there was a d decrease in prescriptions of the old generics, um, and yet there was no comparative benefit shown of those new drugs, right? The regulators didn't require it. When that study was actually done in 2002, funded entirely by the government, um, the comparative benefits were lacking. Right? This kind of negative information, if you're relying on intellectual property, it's really hard. You'd have to uh, police people thinking or um, switching from one drug to another. That's a very hard thing to establish in terms of patent infringement. You could theoretically patent negative information, but uh, the economics involved in trying to police use of that information would be uh, a non-starter for most. So this kind of information, too, is not likely to be prioritized. It's likely to be undervalued, and yet it has significant public health importance. 
right? So there's no necessary relationship between your ability to appropriate a health intervention and the social welfare benefits, right? It's always an open question. Uh, and so if we go in the direction of emphasizing commercialization, it's not clear that these kinds of questions will receive the kind of support and attention that they deserve. Is this actually happening? Well, that's really hard to tell. Are people changing their research questions? What researcher is going to talk about the research they really want to work on as opposed to what they're actually doing. Um, the best evidence that there is this kind of shift in research question as a result of commercialization come from economic studies. This one by Pierre Azoulay of Harvard shows about um, a, a modest increase in uh, a massive study of publications in science uh, where they developed an elaborate coding system to determine the sort of commercial character of the research. And they found that scientists who participate in patenting more tend to move towards a more commercial end of the spectrum. Right? It's modest, and I think we have to take this concern seriously as a result of this kind of econometric study. Second concern with commercialization is its potential to limit knowledge flows. This has been the predominant concern in the literature amongst critics around commercialization. Um, but the evidence, empirically speaking, is actually quite mixed about the impact of, of intellectual property or commercialization. Patents, in particular, don't appear to undermine, right? So the same study I just showed you a moment ago by Pierre Azoulay showed that actually patents seem to increase publication output, not crowd out that kind of activity. Um, similarly, survey data from John Walsh uh, in the United States shows that patents seldom seem to stop basic research in its tracks. Right? They don't seem to have that kind of impact. Academic researchers, uh, for good or not, are potentially just ignoring patents that might uh, be in their way. But it changes. The evidence changes depending on the kind of intellectual property we're talking about. In the only study, to my knowledge, that looked directly at the relationship between intellectual prop property broadly understood and commercialization outcomes, there was a decidedly negative relationship. So this economist compared data that was kept secret for a two-year uh, two period by Solera, Craig Venter's company, compared to the data that was made open by the public human genome sequencing effort, and found that the data uh, that Solera produced was far less likely to be incorporated into a diagnostic test that, uh, that was actually developed. So contractual secrecy, not patents per se, um, seemed to actually undermine, not enhance, commercialization. Okay, so those are two concerns um, with a, a fair bit of nuance with them. But let's think about them in terms of future generations of scientists, um, the intergenerational impact of emphasizing commercialization in the upstream research setting. I'm going to look at some of the survey data in relation to other surveys that have been done uh, by this uh, person, uh, John Walsh in particular, in the United States. So he's done a survey, a few surveys actually, looking at what motivates particular research projects. And as you might expect, um, commercialization motivators like, are the results of my research going to be patentable, tend to be ranked very low in their importance in choosing which research to pursue. On the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see our numbers from our survey. Um, which are broken down by uh, career stage. And we found very similar things for so-called established researchers. But for emerging researchers, and we don't know whether these views uh, and motivators will remain the same, uh, the commercial potential of their research was a significantly stronger motivator. Okay, So we're seeing changes by career stage. A second survey, and this gets at the issue of um, secrecy, really, uh, done by Hong and Walsh in 2009, shows that there's reason to believe that researchers are more concerned about competition and more concerned about um, discussing their research with uh, others. So there was a survey done in the 60s which asked uh, scientists how safe they feel discussing their research with others as a proxy for secrecy, and how worried are they about being anticipated or scooped in their research. And they found in, I'm showing you data uh, from researchers in experimental biology, that there was a significant increase between 66 and 1998. They found that competition was the biggest predictor of secrecy, and at, importantly, though, that the effects of those scientists' 
their participation in commercial activity um, was quite mixed in terms of predicting secrecy. Remember, secrecy is something that I highlighted, at least in one study, seemed to work at cross purposes with commercializing something. Patents in their sample had no impact on secrecy, but industry funding seemed to, in terms of how these researchers responded to how safe they feel discussing their research with others. In our survey, again, broken down by career stage, we're seeing pretty similar numbers to the numbers that Walsh saw in, in, uh, in the 1998 survey. Um, but when we ran some regressions on these responses, we found something slightly different, again, emphasizing the idea that emerging researchers may be thinking about this differently. So competition remains a major predictor of secrecy across career stages, but their interest in commercializing their research remains a stronger or only a significant predictor for secrecy um, for emerging researchers. Established uh, scientists in our sample um, did not seem to be more likely to feel unsafe discussing their research, uh, regardless of whether they were interested in commercializing it or not. So to conclude, my concern is that we move to a, an environment where commercialization in university settings is increasingly normalized, um, that there are these two trade-offs that we have to think about quite seriously, shaping research questions, limiting knowledge flows. Um, there are nuances to these, but there are strong trade-offs, right? If, if it's harder to get funded to do research um, because that knowledge is harder to appropriate, it's harder to fill out the section about the economic benefits for Canada, um, then there are real trade-offs there that have um, consequences in terms of social welfare. And uh, if we are going to sort of uh, embrace uh, um, mechanisms that are supposed to aid commercialization, but the empirical evidence suggests it's actually more complicated and some kinds of tools, um, like contractual arrangements that preserve a level of secrecy, might actually inhibit commercialization. Um, I think we have to think, think very seriously about those, particularly if new researchers are more alive to those kinds of tools um, than uh, current and, and uh, former researchers in the health field. Thank you very much.